Hey guys, we are in the basement and today we're gonna revisit a game. We're gonna revisit one of my favorite games of all time. And you know what, this game, we actually did a review of this game a long time ago. But I've been getting messages here and there over the last couple years saying, hey, John, why don't you do a proper review of Mario Brothers? And you know what? You're right. We have never done a proper review of Mario Brothers. And this was actually one of the very first games I got. Because um, actually the first game I ever got was Donkey Kong, which is right here. And we've revisited this and we've done a nice lengthy video of it. And the second game I got was Miss Pac-Man. And then the third game I picked up was Mario Brothers. And here it is. This is a Mario Brothers wide body it's an original dedicated machine and this is actually the third game i ever got and i did a review for this game a long time ago but at the time i didn't really quite understand how to do these youtube videos and the and my camera sucked and the video i did for this was only a minute and a half long so today we're gonna take our time and we're gonna talk about mario brothers we're gonna play the game we're gonna really play it and we're gonna go inside the cabinet i'm gonna show you guys like you know the monitor and the pcb and how it all works and all that stuff and we're just gonna to talk, take our time and really talk about Mario Brothers. Now, Mario Brothers was released in 1983 by Nintendo, and this game is really important. Um, it's actually the third game um, to have Mario in it. Uh, you, of course, the first game is over here, and it was Donkey Kong. Now, Donkey Kong came out in 1981, and at the time, this guy didn't even have a name. Um, they actually just called him Jumpman. You can see right here, okay? And then by the time they got to Donkey Kong Jr., which was the sequel to Donkey Kong and Mario's second game, they did name him, and they called him Mario. And so at this point, you know, he's kind of like, he is like a mascot for Nintendo, you know? And Shigeru Miyamoto developed Mario Brothers, released it in 1983, and this game really kind of introduced a lot of things that we know today from the Mario universe. Well, for one, it introduced his brother, Luigi. I mean, this was the first time we saw Luigi. And another thing it introduced was turtles. I mean, there's turtles in this game. Look at this, there's pipes in the game. There are so many things from the Mario universe that were introduced in this game. And, and this game also established Mario as a plumber. Because I think originally in Donkey Kong, they kind of had the idea that he was like a carpenter, you know? Um, I think Donkey Kong was supposed to be like a construction site, you know? And these are girders of a construction site that, that Donkey Kong kind of distorts when he jumps. And in, in Junior, I don't really think they addressed his profession at all because Donkey Kong was more the star of this. Um, but in Mario Brothers, they really established that Mario and Luigi were plumbers, and you were basically in the sewers here trying to get rid of these 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 pests, these these bugs and these turtles and stuff that are in the sewers. And they also also established this whole idea that uh, you're hitting blocks, um, you're hitting enemies from underneath and turning them upside down and killing them. So really, a lot of the building blocks of Super Mario Brothers were in this game. And also, a lot of this, the elements that make up the entire Mario, Mario universe as we know it today. I mean, if we go play new Super Mario Brothers that was released this year, you know, for the 3DS or for the Wii U or whatever, you know, it's this. I mean, the, the core idea is in this game right here. And it was released in 83. And then in 85, they released Super Mario Brothers, which basically took this whole idea of platforming and hitting blocks and collecting coins, and they made it scroll. And that was Super Mario Brothers. So um, anyway, let's talk about the cabinet a little bit. Now, this is an original dedicated Mario Brothers. And you will see out there a lot of conversions because Nintendo sold this as a conversion kit and also as a dedicated version. And what does that mean? Well, the conversion kit would come in a box. You know, if I was an operator, say I had an arcade or, you know, or I put games out on location. Let's say I had a Donkey Kong or Donkey Kong Jr. And, you know, I bought Donkey Kong in 1981. Let's say it's the year 1983, right? and I am in the business of, of putting arcades in laundromats or, or bars or Kmarts or wherever, you, you know, you would find arcade games like everywhere, okay? So I would put a Donkey Kong on location, I'd stick it in Kmart, let's say, and I had it there for a couple years and it's, it's stopped earning money, okay? In 81, it was earning a lot of money. In 82, it was doing okay. In 83, it was really a dog. You know, the game just wasn't earning money anymore. It wasn't new. So Nintendo would sell these kits. You would buy this box 
and it would have all the parts to convert a Donkey Kong. You convert this wooden cabinet into a Don uh, into a Mario Brothers. And uh, so you will see a lot of converted Donkey Kongs or Popeyes or Donkey Kong Juniors that are converted to Mario Brothers. And you know what? They're not bad looking. They're a pretty okay looking cabinet. The problem is, is that this cabinet is not very wide, okay? So you're gonna end up with two sets of controls on here because Mario Brothers is a, is a two player simultaneous game if you want. And if you do want to play with a buddy, you're cramped because this is not a very wide control panel, okay? So Nintendo also had the dedicated version, which was a wider cabinet and that's what this is right here and there's always one easy a little clue that you can look for to figure out if you're looking at a, an original or a conversion Mario Brothers and that is the speaker hole right here if the speaker hole is in the center of the cabinet you see how that's perfectly centered then that's a Mario Brothers wide body okay and if you see that the speaker hole is off center it's to the left see on those that's a conversion cabinet. That means that someone took a Donkey Kong or a Donkey Kong Jr. and they converted it to Mario Brothers. Now, in my opinion, the conversions are not nearly as desirable as the wide bodies because I think the wide body is actually a very cool cabinet. And there's some distinct kind of little differences um, with materials that they did. Um, the Mario Brothers wide body has a metal control panel. I think the conversion was does too, because at some point Nintendo actually switched to using metal for control panels. Um, they did on Donkey Kong 3. I think they did on the conversion uh, Mario Brothers control panels too. But anyway, um, there's a metal control panel. Uh, let's see what else. The the coin doors they started using were an over and under style right there, which is very different than they were using uh, back in the earlier cabinets. They all had these kind of uh, rather unique uh, coin doors. Um, that I think were just kind of uh, uh, very stylistic of the Japanese arcades at the time. Because um, a lot of these uh, cabinets, like these two here, were actually made in Japan and brought over on a boat. Um, so they had a lot of Japanese parts on them. Now, this has like a very over and under style. It's actually, it's two separate um, over and under coin doors. And that was, uh, I think, kind of the style in the 80s. You know, this, this cabinet here is from 83 also, and it's got over and under coin doors. Um, and, the, and the idea of the over and under was is that you could have two keys, basically. And uh, you could give a key to your clerk to fix the coin mechs, right? But he couldn't get to the money, because the money was in the bottom one. And then, and then the owner of the game would have a separate key for the money, okay? So if you didn't trust your employees, you could just give them a key to the top coin door, uh, and they could only get to these parts here to fix this. And then, but they could never get to the money, so you'd have that separate key. So um, that seemed to be like a trend in the later games. Actually, Atari did that a lot. I, uh, not these, actually. It seemed like in the later games, they went to the over and under. Um, but I don't think that's actually a rule because, oh, this is from 83. Um, Gottlieb seemed to use over and under coin doors. But anyway, it's a minor trivial, trivial point. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's got the wide, it's a wide cabinet, it's a plywood cabinet. Um, a lot of the uh, later model or US made Nintendo cabinets were made out of particle board. This is actually made out of plywood. Um, there's actually two different variants of the Mario Brothers marquee. Um, some of them have a little speech bubble coming out, I think Luigi, that says something like two player action or something like that. So um, what else? You know what, why don't we go to the back of the cabinet? Let me show you guys what's working there, work going on back there. Um, I was gonna pull the game out, but I, I, I don't feel like it, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you can kind of see the side art. The side art's actually really cool. Maybe I'll put an image um, of the side art in the movie right now, but uh, I, I'm not in the mood to pull the game out. Please, I'm sorry. It's just, it's gonna be a pain in my ass. So, but we're gonna go in the back and I will show you guys what it looks like back there. So let's go to the back of the game. Okay, so we're back behind the game here. Let me turn this light on. Um, so originally, the back door would have had a lock right here. And Nintendo used the same keyed lock on all of their back doors. And it's a, it's a, it's a Takagen 6510. And I actually have a bunch of those keys because you'll find the games that still have the lock in them. And actually the Nintendo Red Tent actually uses that same lock and it's a barrel type lock. Um, you can actually buy reproductions of the key. Um, so they would use a common key on the back door, but they would not use a common key on the coin door um, because that's the money, you know? So they don't want people to be able to get to the money, um, but 
but for whatever reason, they'd use the common key on the back doors and operators would keep those common keys in. And that basically means that if you wanted to, uh, you know, go and get into somebody's game on location, if you had that common key, you could. And I always thought that was kind of interesting that they would use those common keys everywhere. Um, so anyway, I don't have the lock in here. What I do instead is I usually throw some screws in here. And so let's remove the screws. Okay, so we're just gonna take the back door off. And I just, kinda, just wanna show you guys what's going on inside this game. And uh, it's always interesting when you open up these big, giant wooden boxes and you realize there's not much in there at all. So anyway, this I haven't been in here in a while. I've actually, I probably haven't opened this back door in like three years. Um, but you can see it looks actually really clean in here. And it's a nice plywood cabinet. Um, You've got these ground straps going all around. Uh, this is a Nintendo 20 Easy monitor. It's, it's, it's made by Sanyo. Um, this is actually mounted horizontally, okay? It's a horizontal monitor. Um, and down here we have our transformer uh, assembly on the right, and we have our power supply on the left. And I believe, yeah, this, this power supply would be the same one you'd find on, on Donkey Kong and Junior and all that. Um, we have right here, um, actually this is from the coin door side, you have a service switch and a coin counter. And we'll look at that actually from the front. Um, and then here's where the PCB lives. And it's in an RF cage, okay? And uh, so back in the 80s, uh, I think that the US government and everybody, they're all paranoid that these games were gonna be dumping a lot of um, just radio frequency frequency waves or whatever radio waves into the air that would interfere with radios and TVs and police uh, you know radios and emergency radios and whatever so they were requiring a lot of these manufacturers to put the games in these RF cages and so the PCB lives inside this cage and the idea here is that this would basically prevent whatever radio waves this thing was emitting from leaving the box or at least it would diffuse them a little bit um, and then over here is a little filter board I think and you can see right here it says FCC um, which is the Federal Communications something something. I don't, I don't, actually, I don't even know what that stands for. Um, and I don't think we're going to pull the PCB out. We can kind of look in there and see it. Um, there's actually a hole right here so you can get in there and adjust the dip switch settings so you can uh, change the different settings of the game. Uh, I'm trying to just peek in here. I don't know if there's any little... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a PCB. There's really nothing special about it. Um, it's a very typical Nintendo type PCB. Um, down here is an outlet right there. Do you see that? Um, and you'll notice here that it says AC 100 volts. Can you guys see that? Um, and that's actually pretty important to note because all of these Nintendo monitors, and basically this plug right here is a, is a 100 volt plug. And what you do is you plug the monitor into this and also the marquee light. Um, and it comes like that from the factory already plugged in. And, and basically that's important to note because, um, and I believe that power is isolated. It comes through this isolation transformer first. Um, and it is important to know though that Nintendo monitors and also the marquee lights run on 100 volts AC and it's 100 volts isolated power. So um, just because you have a Sanyo 20 EZ with a plug that looks like it could plug into a wall, do not plug it into your wall because you will, you will destroy the monitor. So just keep that in mind. Um, as tempting as it is, um, if you have a Sanyo 20 ZE sitting on your workbench and you just like, you know, capped the monitor, do not plug it into the wall. It has to plug into that 100 volt plug that's on the bottom of the cabinet. So um, other than that, you know, that's pretty much the game back here. Um, we do have a serial tag right here. And you can see that this is model number TMA1-UP-US. And I, I, the UP, I guess, is for upright. US is for USA. Uh, um, not sure what TMA1 is supposed to mean. Um, and you also see that the serial number here is 2,632. So this was the 2,632nd cabinet that they made. I actually have no idea how many they made. Um, and also you see on these screw holes, uh, there's some junk in here. And actually Nintendo put that junk in those screw holes at the factory so people couldn't steal this uh, nameplate. And also, when you would get a conversion kit, they would include a nameplate like this. And so you will find converted games 
that have these nameplates on it and people think, oh my God, this is factory original because it has the nameplate. No, that's not true at all. The, the nameplates came in the conversion kits and most of the operators would screw them to the back of the cabinet and that does not mean that that is an original dedicated cabinet, okay? You cannot assume that at all. Um, a good clue, though, is if it does have this junk in the screws that the, that the nameplate's never been removed. So, okay, I think we're going to put the back door on, and then let's go to the front of the cabinet, and uh, let me just throw this on real quick, and we'll go to the front. Okay, we're in the front here, and before we play the game, actually, I want to show you guys inside the coin door real quick. Um, and actually, I have a key for it. When I first started collecting these games, I, I was getting unique locks for every game, and I was making these keychains. And it was actually a really great idea in the beginning, but I realized soon that I just couldn't keep up with this, and it was a little obnoxious having all these key, giant keychains in a bag. So eventually I went to all the same lock, and I don't do this anymore, but this is a remnant of my early collecting days. And so let's unlock this. And okay, so inside here, um, you can see there is a service switch right there. And uh, if you wanted to, I don't know if I push that. Actually, um, this is to coin up the game. It's, it's one way to coin up the game. And then also if you're in the menu system, sometimes it'll use that. Okay, so now let's look over here at the coin counter. This is actually very interesting because I don't think I've ever looked at this. Um, this game has been played 9,868 times. That's actually not a lot. Um, and that's that's uh, how many times it's been played with a quarter. So if I were to hit the uh, if I hit the credit on the it should advance. Let's see if it does. Uh, it's not advancing, huh? I have it on free play. That could be why. Um, so 9,868 times this game has been played. That's actually not a lot compared to some of the other games that we've looked at in the basement here. Um, that means that this game's earned about $2,500 on location. I would say that that is not really a, a, a good success because I bet you this game cost about $2,500 when it came out. So really interesting. I, of course, have it on free play now. I actually installed uh, the Brazington High Score Save and uh, free play kit, and it's a little daughter board that goes on the main PCB. Um, and so if you, ever, if you have a Mario Brothers and you want that kit, um, I would just Google, if you just Google uh, a Mario Brothers high score save Brazington, it should come right up. So, all right, why don't we set up the tripod and let me show you guys how Mario Brothers plays. Okay, we have the tripod set up. So let's go over the controls really quick here. Um, so again, this game is a two-player simultaneous game. You can play cooperatively or competitively against your friend or enemy. Um, and actually, that's where this game really shines. Um, if you play this game with a buddy and you both cooperate, okay, and it's really important because that's when the game's fun. It's actually not fun when you mess with each other. So if you play with a friend and you both cooperate, um, it's actually a really fun game to play because you guys can talk to each other and come up with a plan to get rid of the enemies and, and flipping them over and, and kicking them off the screen. It's actually a lot of fun to play with a friend. So if you have an opportunity to play Play this with a friend do it okay um, so the controls are pretty simple um, each player gets a joystick and a jump button uh, the joysticks are two-way two directional joysticks you only can move left and right there's no up and up and down in this on these joysticks um, there's a restrictor play down here and you can only move them left and right which is fine because that's all we need for this game is left and right direction um, so let's go ahead and start a game okay we have the game on free play and so let's go ahead and start a game when I press one player start so in the beginning here it says hey this is how you play the game we have the shell creepers which they were calling the turtles at the time hit them underneath and then jump up and kick them off and then after you kill them they kind of uh, are re reincarnated as a coin okay so what I usually try to do is come up here as fast as I can and you actually want to try to group them together after you kick them after you flip them over because you'll get bonus points and we didn't get any bonus points there at all um, I'm actually gonna try to get as far as I can I'm not like the best Mario Brothers player in the world and I know you guys that are so you can see we got a little bonus there. We got 1,600 points for the second shell in a row instead of uh, 800 each. And you can see if you wait too long, the turtles will will come out of their shell and flip themselves back over. I want to get all these coins before we leave. Okay, so we did okay. 
And, and basically, and this is actually the bonus level here. So we've just cleared the first couple levels, which are the turtle levels. And now this is a bonus level and we have a, a finite amount of time to get every coin on this bonus level. And you can see the timer counting down in the center. And I actually never really find that to be very difficult. Um, they're gonna make it a little harder later by making the platforms invisible and adding ice to them. Okay, so we're on the sidestepper level, which are these little crab guys. And these guys you have to hit twice from underneath um, to flip them over. And what I usually do on this level is this right here. I hit the pow, and the, when you hit the pow, it actually turn, it actually hits the enemies that are on the ground and flips them over. Okay, there we go. So we did okay on that level. We didn't get as many points as we could, but we got past it. Cause that's what I'm, I'm just trying to get kind of far on here. Cause I want to show you guys like all the different stuff. Okay, so doom, doom. All right, let's get both these turtles. And I'm trying to keep them together so I get a bonus. And I did, I got an 800 point bonus. I got 1600 points for the second shell. Ah, that guy's in a bad spot. I'm just gonna turn him over. And you see those fireballs there? If you linger too long on these levels, okay, now we're introducing the fighter fly, which are these bouncing fly guys, and you can only hit them and kill them when they're touching the platform, which can get kind of tricky. Excellent. And so that pow button down there is ineffective and it doesn't hurt them unless they're touching the platform. And hopefully I can get these, this guy before the fireball comes out. Because if I linger too long, a fireball will come out after me. All right, we're doing okay. Ah. So it's getting a little tricky right now. Get rid of him. I'm surprised I haven't had a fireball come out to get me. Because usually if you linger like this, you're toast. And so after every every time you kill an enemy, they, they reincarnate as a uh, as a fire as a coin. So you kinda have to be prepared. And you also need to decide what's more important. Uh, clearing the level, killing the enemies or grabbing those coins. Ah, oh, that was a dumb move. All right, so after you die, you 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 come up here on this platform and the platform's kind of melting away and you have to kind of um, decide when to jump off of it. Otherwise, it'll just throw you off of it. All right, I want to get that guy. See his he's starting to move, he's starting to turn, ah. And after the, he comes back to life, he's actually kind of moving faster and he's a little bit mad. All right, let's get past this stupid level. So when they get to the bottom, they go into the bottom pipe and then they come back out the top and they'll come back out the, the, the pipe they went in. So they go in the left pipe, they come out the top left. All right, I'm getting a little upset here. I'm just gonna try to get rid of one of these with the pow. Shit! Come on, all right, come on, get off, get off, get off. If I fall apart on this level, I'm gonna be really mad. <laughs> it is possible to kill the fireballs, by the way. Right that, see? On your mark. Shit. Alright, we have to clear this level. There's one. Alright, let's get rid of him. And when the enemy encounters a downed enemy, he'll turn around. So I knew that that fly couldn't come get me. All right, I gotta get up there. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. Please hurry. Oh! Bullshit. <laughs> Seriously, what the hell? All right, come on, come on. All right, get him, get him, get him, get him. Ah. So what I find is that if I don't get rid of everything really quick, I fall apart. All right, so now it's introducing slip ice, which are these little guys, and when, and when they melt, they freeze the platform. And, but first we're gonna do a bonus level, and the bonus level has frozen platforms. 
which basically make it hard for Mario to turn around really fast. And so here he slides, see that? But it's still not that hard. Okay. So we get a little bonus for getting all of them. All right, so let's get up here. Huh. Kind of hesitated there, I don't know why. I just want to get rid of this damn firefly guy, like, right away. And so now you can see it's starting to mix up the different types of bad guys. And here's the ice guy, and if you kill him... Ugh. Well, we did okay. You know, 78,870. That's not a bad score. It's an okay score. But that's really the game. It just gets harder and harder and harder. It starts introducing more stuff. It starts combining more things. Um, there are these icicles that start forming that actually I have a very hard time getting to the icicles. Um, the icicles will start forming on the tops of the levels and they'll start dripping, dripping, and then they'll fall. And it's actually pretty hard. So you can see I have some friends who are really good at this game. Um, the top score is uh, from Don Hayes, who is the Centipede World Record holder. He got a 300,000 on this game, which is which is really a ridiculous score. So, all right, guys, uh, that's it. You know, that is Mario Brothers. I hope you guys enjoyed this revisit here. Um, you know, I, I had to go back to a lot of my old videos because, you know, when I started doing the videos, I had a really bad camera. I didn't really know quite yet what John's Arcade really was. And so there might be some videos I can improve on. I think this was one of those. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I mean, Mario Brothers Wide Bot, the Mario Brothers to me is just one of the absolute classics. It's a really important game in Nintendo's history because they introduced so many elements that are still in the Mario games today. And really, this was the, the prequel to Super Mario Brothers. And, and this is right when they were really starting to figure out who Mario was and what his universe and world was was all about. So, all right, guys, that's it for me. Um, I do want to thank you for subscribing to my channel. Um, I do try to release videos every Sunday and sometimes in between. I'm really trying to do videos twice a week. It's actually proving to be kind of difficult. Um, we will get back to the Pac-Man Cabaret. I just kind of wanted to take a break from that for this video. Um, also, I do want to remind you that I'm doing a podcast now called Arcade Outsiders. We have a website at ArcadeOutsiders.com. We're doing that podcast live every Tuesday night at 11 p.m. Eastern Time on AllGames.com. Com. And this podcast actually follows my other podcast, Video Game Outsiders, at VideoGameOutsiders.com. And we do Video Game Outsiders live 9 p.m. Eastern on AllGames.com every Tuesday. So check that stuff out, guys. Again, thanks for watching my videos. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for all the support. It really means a lot. Check out my website, JohnsArcade.com. And also join the forums. Actually, the forums are actually pretty active lately. So if you want to get a hold of me, if you want to talk to me, if you want to talk to other collectors um, or other people who are trying to be collectors, go to johnsarcade.com, join the forums, and make a post. Introduce yourself. Let's talk about this stuff. All right, guys, that's it. I will see you later. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.